welcome or welcome back. This is the final session of the 13th Annual Agroforestry Symposium. This event is hosted by the Center for Agroforestry at the University of Missouri, the ancestral lands of the Osage, Oto, Missouri, Alaini, Iowa, Peoria, and Osseti Sakawan peoples. As we close this very fruitful day of learning and sharing and connecting, I want to again express gratitudes for all of the human and more than human communities who sustain us and whose stories are embedded in the lands we know. For the generous sponsors of this event, whose names um, have been listed on the screen that's been showing in the community forum hour, and for the presenters who have shared their time and wisdom with us today, and for the abundance in the fields and forests wherever we find ourselves at home. I am so honored to introduce Frank Kanawa Lake. Frank is a research ecologist with the USDA Forest Service for the Pacific Southwest Research Station Fire and Fuels Program, where he serves as the tribal liaison and climate change contact. He's also the lead coordinating scientist for the Redwood Experimental Forest and Western Klamath Restoration Partnership Landscape Collabor Collaborative. His research is focused on restoration ecology and the incorporation of indigenous knowledge in climate change science wildland fire and forest management in the Pacific Northwest in Northern California. Frank is a Fireline qualified resource advisor and has worked with tribes, agencies, organizations, and incident management teams on wildland fire assignments. If you've watched Inhabitants, you will have seen Frank featured in the film. Um, and among his many roles as an educator, Frank serves as an advisor to the Nature Conservancy's Indigenous Peoples Burning Network and has played a major role in the traditional ecological knowledge section of the Ecological Society of America. I have certainly learned so much from you, Frank, uh, from your publications and presentations that I've had the fortune to be exposed to. And I'm so grateful that you could join us for today. Okay, we'll try this the best I can with them at home. All right, well, thank you for the opportunity to present and speak on this. What I would like to do today is share my uh, overview of kind of tribal agroforestry in the Pacific West, um, share ideas on examples of how tribal land and resource stewardship and agroforestry practices relate to one another across the Western region or Pacific West region, promote knowledge sharing regarding the relevance of agroforestry concepts to tribal agricultural natural resource management, civil cultural uh, and managing non timber forest products, looking at wildland fire management for cultural resources, and then the emerging and important role that tribal nurseries and the role of plant materials in agroforestry and other restoration efforts. So what are some of the tribal climate adaptation strategies to consider? Um, the most commonly tribal desired plants such as trees, shrubs, understory plants, and fungi to consider that increase ecosystem services and increase climate change at the depth of capacity. Some of the primary considerations are for civil culture or forest farming um, and wildland fire management coupled with indigenous fire stewardship, which is the management of those plant, animal, and fungi resources uh, and habitats uh, between cultural burning and selecting, establishing, and maintaining plant species for climate conservation and economic interests and values. And there are other factors um, or emerging issues that could affect how agroforestry managers will select, establish, and maintain habitats or vegetation, um, having drought tolerant fire depth species as those culturally significant resources for and supporting socio-ecological resilience. So, you know, what is tribal agroforestry? And this has really been the work of, uh, I'll feature them at the end of my slides, but with the work of the National Agroforestry Center um, and the PNW Tribal Agroforestry Working Group with those at Oregon State University, but this working definition is tribal or indigenous agroforestry, which includes agriculture, forestry, and wildland fire management. I don't mind also at range. Um, includes culturally informed or traditional ecological knowledge based practices that integrate the management of trees, plants, fungi, and animals to serve the needs of indigenous communities, tribes, and a broader society. So this is kind of a conceptual diagram that I helped develop with that work. Um, and when we think about tribal agroforestry and climate adaptation, what is it and what can it be? Uh, my working definition here is the in intentional selection of plants, fungi, and animals, both be it domestic cultivars and wild genetic variants, that can increase the resistance and resilience of the environment and human communities through agroforestry management strategies that increase the adaptive capacity of our socio-ecological systems. Acknowledging the historical factors and planning for the future adaptation, um, kind of this cont continuum or this timeline example here, 
You know, we have to really recon come to reconciliation or reconcile what's happened through the pra practices or the effects of colonization on indigenous communities and those indigenous agroforestry practices and systems that were in place here across Western North America. And part of that is looking at where we move to the future, which is increased resilience of these forest agricultural systems to those climate change threats and stressors that really vary by region and indigenous community or each of our communities. It also includes adoption of those agroforestry practices for climate mitigation and ideally sustainability for sociocultural agroforestry practices and markets moving into the future. This is represented in some of the work I've been doing with the Shelstein Adams, um, looking at kind of the historical management goals around food, textiles, shelter, medicines, uh, ceremonial ritual purposes of the use of resources, contemporary management goals of tribes or indigenous communities around reforestation, restoration, wildlife, climate change, invasive species, which are changing the, the many of the biophysical and other factors ecologically of our communities and in disturbance regimes. And then how that relates to contemporary cultural goals for the preservation of knowledge and cultural practices, education, be it also the integration of indigenous and Western knowledge systems that relate to food security or sovereignty, medicines, textiles, and economics, particularly in the emergent uh, aspects of bioeconomy, sustainable forest management related to agroforestry as a lens that we look at it today for climate adaptation. So some of my methods and my approach um, have been to describe and characterize those tribally valued agricultural and forest resources and habitats, such as water being a critically important one, foods, me medicines, materials, regalia, or ceremonial species um, that are used for subsistence, ceremonial, and economic resources and stewardship, um, identifying those climate and wildfire impacts on tribally valued agroforestry habitats and resources, um, noting that tribes utilize many species not emphasized in existing Western science-based climate synthesis. So how do we focus on that and consider that more inclusively? I um, also like the one about gender and, and, and a broad spectrum of inclusivity of the of perspectives around agroforestry that was mentioned earlier by our, some of our other speakers on the panel this morning. And having that be an interdisciplinary approach to synthesize sociocultural and ecological data to identify what those threats and stressors are, in our case, it might be wildfires or drought or other factors, of those forested ecosystems and cultural practices for those habitats. And a lot of this work is through the Karuk University of California, Berkeley, um, research where we have this current um, plot example here, bringing cultural practitioners out where we combine Western field sampling methods with practitioner evaluation to get a fine scale um, understanding of how resource conditions are changing and how that's affecting cultural practitioners or tribal uses in our area. And then ideas for restoration, for resilience and recovery and adaptation. Part of that evaluation process is um, thinking about what resources are at risk from climate change and other related disturbances. And again, on that spectrum of both ceremonial subsistence and commercial uses, what, uh, what scale and that socio-ecological system are we considering? Have that identification and understanding of those pathways or the mechanisms of disturbance and those that are felt differently, especially from maybe farmers or ranchers, um, practitioners on the ground versus maybe what a downscale climate model, uh, model might forecast. And then thinking about how that evaluation and assessment processes are used, bringing together those knowledge systems um, within that Western and traditional uh, knowledge approaches. And then what metrics are used? You know, science, there's some. We might be looking at plant species cover, um, proportion of areas, tree stem density, things like that, um, crops, crop yield. But there's also culturally uh, metrics or indicators that might be important. And then how does agroforestry blend that together for both agricultural and forestry? with that eye towards climate adaptation. So for me, this is really about, you know, incorporating indigenous and Western knowledge into the full cycle of the research to create that best available science or the co-production of that, um, where it influences management, policy development, and then there's co-beneficiaries being a form of justice. And so what are the researchable questions and science support needs of that indigenous community or their management challenges? Um, as a researcher conducting to have the pre prior informed consent of that tribe and working with their knowledge and their cultural practices that helps define the metrics and methods of what you're going to study and how, how you go about analyzing that um, and what are the important variables there to consider, how you share your understanding of the findings in that discussion that then lead to science to guide that management or to affect and revise policy. And then where that comes back around to the, the end user, um, for tribes and society as being the co-beneficiaries of that knowledge to improve conditions on the ground, um, again, uh, for the benefit of how that knowledge has been applied and where it makes a difference at home. Giving some brief overviews on um, 
Indigenous Fire Knowledge. This is work with Mary Huffman and the Indigenous Peoples Burning Network. You know, there's a variety of these elements uh, that include both geology, topography, and soils, vegetation or fuels that combustible material or carbon, weather factors that really influence fire behavior or the agroforestry resources, fire operations, which I'll talk more about um, in the management and stewardship, and, and especially for desired fire effects or outcomes, and understanding that there's different levels of fire governance, not only in how state and federal and tribal have more of the federal approach of managing wildfires, um, but also that there's traditional aspects of fire governance, these other social factors. And so this is the work I learned uh, in the Karuk and Yurok community, as an example here of uh, Laverne Ferris Blaze, my community mentor, with her grandkids, both burning in and evaluating and picking hazel shoots for basketry material. So there's this kind of philosophy here um, uh, that fire is medicine amongst many indigenous communities living within fire prone ecosystems, um, dependent upon fire dependent species as part of that fire regime that relate to the evolution of cultural fire regimes that emerge from those cultural adaptations to fire. Um, and climate to form fire dependent cultures. And then the spatial and temporal extent of that indigenous fire use really varies by that ecosystem or habitat linked to those fire affected resources of value. And so in the Pacific West, it could be many of the oaks and pines, um, prairie lands, meadows, um, even riparian habitats across the Midwest. It might be more the prairie grass systems in the East. It could be the hardwood forest, but each of these really had kind of the own aspect of indigenous fire stewardship or those ancestral um, in agroforestry systems that have legacy co contributions to our understanding today of how to live within there and maybe for guiding our climate adaptation strategies in the future. Some of these historical reasons are also of contemporary importance to tribes today. And we see this um, across the North America for hunting, crop management, particularly berries and other foods and nuts, pest management, reducing those pests, range, um, which is important for ungulates and for the other forage quality, Reducing fire threats or fire danger by fireproofing, clearing areas for travel then was by foot trails or repairing areas, but also today along our egress and access routes um, as our network across our landscapes. Clearing and repairing areas, basketry is a really important one, um, and fuel wood and many more other modern aspects of today. Some of the distinguishing characteristics of indigenous fire stewardship and cultural fire regimes are the modification uh, from different from lightning ignitions which is often the frequency, more specific applications of fire for those resource values and objectives, often more frequent than lightning ignitions specific to that resource or particular habitats. The seasonality can differ for burning often at different times than lightning ignitions, um, often having cultural indicators linked to phenology and uh, whether it's migratory birds, bud break, um, the, the fall might be other aspects of that to consider for local indicators. The specificity, those ignition strategies within different ecosystems and habitats, for various species as uses resources, and I'll get to some examples of that here soon. And then responsibility for fire use. Again, if fire is medicine, you're prescribing the right amount or the right dose for the well-being and integrity of that system. Um, and many Native people, the, as uh, Dr. Wildcat talked about, you know, our relations is having that responsibility to care for all things in our environment, just not the human aspect. And another thing that was really mentioned this morning, uh, which was great by Melinda was, you know, recognizing that different members of indigenous communities hold different types of knowledge um, and practice various types of cultural burning. So a lot of my work with elder basket weaver women has definitely informed me differently than say working with elder men or men practitioners. So the differences in the indigenous fire stewardship or cultural burning reflect roles based on those ceremonial or spiritual roles, subsistence, domestic or home household, um, family, economic and security responsibilities and governance. And so in working with Diverse indigenous communities, whether it's across villages or tribes, groups such as clans or family organized, um, and leaders support the inclusivity of a fuller range of that knowledge, particularly across gender and, and, and different ceremonial or, or cultural roles. And drawing upon the work from the Karuk tribe, um, there's an aspect here of, you know, all our different forest ranges and habitats having kind of a lower to higher elevation. And this one shows the different cultural management zones and how there's cultural indicators about how and where you use fire across the seasons specific to some of these different vegetation types. And you can think about the Klamath Mountains being similar to Appalachia um, and its forest diversity, uh, geology. And so we have different complexities of our landscapes that also reflect the timing of burning and the cultural use and management of those agroforestry resources across that landscape in elevational ranges. 
There's emerging aspects here that I like to share with you that's at least here in the West um, called pyro civil culture, pyro being fire, civil culture being the management of those forests um, to support agroforestry. And so this recent paper by North et al for the Sierra Nevada and for other places across the West, the dry West, kind of have this anchor concept of looking at places on the landscape um, at the stand level and thinking about ecosystem assets, whether that's both the economic aspects or conservation species like threatened endangered species and then having revenue where you might be thinking about where you actually have a, a greater benefit of managing for timber that has market preferences. I would say also in taking this, you can think about what are landscape restoration strategies and the priorities, how indigenous knowledge or those agroforestry interests um, inform the prescriptions for manual, which is usually the understory chainsaw thinning or manipulations, mechanical being the more equipment based stuff. This individual clumps and openings or ICO is about heterogeneity and looking at fuel and vegetation configuration. And then with the effort of those treatments, how do you increase the proportion of the drought tolerant fire adapted species? Um, and look at and supporting the reintroduction of prescribed or fire or cultural burning, but as well as managing wildfire to achieve a range of resource objectives or to protect life and property and infrastructure when necessary. Um, another aspect of my work for, for some of you is this, I use um, fixed area forestry plots that are often nested. This one kind of shows a evergreen huckleberry with a tan oak forest and Douglas fir, a LIDAR point cloud imagery. And then when looking at that, you know, what is thinned or what is cut um, and then what is retained and how do we nudge the system through our several cultural treatments or with the forest farming and agroforestry approach to promoting those food fiber and other uh, resources as part of that kind of dynamics of managing the forest. Related to that, um, here's a schematic on that aspect of it. So can pyro civil culture and forest farming be a form of climate adaptation, particularly when we're looking at retaining those drought tolerant fire adapted species like in our case, the sugar pine or pines, Hazelnut as an understory, thinking about the mycorrhizal relationship in understory, and then how fire as an energetically efficient tool can be brought into that. So in many cases out in the West, using agroforestry and hazardous fuels reduction, thinking about defensible space around our communities and wildland urban interface, um, reduce surface and ladder fuels that increase safe and efficient wildfire response, um, the suppressing where we need to, but also conducting prescriber cultural burning in and around our communities, and then thinking about how that simultaneously through our prescriptions can increase the yield of products um, by wildfire season and frequency. Here's another kind of diagram and schematic here of the Sierra Nevada. You have kind of this more lightning dominated regime in the top of mixed pine, fir, understory. The middle shows kind of a scenario of indigenous fire and lightning um, that promotes our open full crown oaks, big pines, diversity of understory plants for foods, medicines, and materials. And then the bottom one kind of representing more fire exclusion or industrial forest management plantations where it's really thick and it's highly at risk or highly vulnerable to the disturbances of drought and wildfire and pest and climate. So how do we restore a system um, back to the more formal, more resilient aspects that we value? Here's an example from the Sierra Nevada and working with the North Fork Mono and Chansey tribes. But we're seeing here, you know, that really it's the restoration of landscape and cultural practices that ecocultural restoration for ecosystems and human health. Um, it's through these partnerships that we are able to learn and integrate um, landscape restoration strategies with traditional knowledge and stewardship practices. Part of this was identifying current and former orchards. I think there's this notion that is part of our Western academic trained philosophy that, oh, there's wild lands out there or that this was a natural system. But many areas across Western North America, pretty, particularly the oak dominated or hardwood zones, really were orchards and there's a legacy of those in areas that we need to recognize from that former indigenous fire stewardship that are, could also be informative for restoring components or guiding our restoration today, especially looking through an agroforestry lens for these systems. That leads to the act of restoration of both thinning and burning. Consider how we evaluate whether well, those resources are available in the desired quantity and quality. Um, again, what are the metrics there? Is it the trees per acre, basal area, stem density, is it the number of full crown oaks that can produce acorns? Is your metric the proportion of good acorns or the number of acorn soup servings that derive from that forest management or the agroforestry system that you're, that you're working to create? Another example here for tan oak showing my, my home and my property here around Orleans, California in the Klamath Mountains. Um, really continue to be a cultural staple for our area. This was really a, mod, a traditional burning in a modern context to achieve multiple objectives. Uh, back on this Trex burn in 2015, which I've had a couple burns since then, 
was for research treatments, was for food security, was to reduce hazardous fuels in the my egress route around my property, and then really promoted the good white top, good acorns that fell on charred grounds. And that's an important aspect to be thinking about um, as we bring this together. And there's many other oak woodlands, our nut crops across the US and our areas, and we can be thinking more of this integrated approach. With that, um, relates to civil pasture in many areas as one of the agroforestry practices, thinking about the thinning and burning or the alignment of civil cultural and fuels treatments with burning to promote forage and conditions for ungulates or other domestic uh, and wild animals. Um, the Osage speaker today mentioned about having cattle and, and buffalo as an important element of that. That can be seen here in the picture from the uh, southeast, but also many other places. It's important to bring these together and thinking about civil culture or civil pasture and for the management of our uh, ungulates, um, both native and, and some of our domesticated animals. For me, this looks like, you know, really uh, some of that work bringing it home. We've been seeing, at least when I was raising these hogs, um, they really keyed in on areas that had the greatest quality of acorns and a more understory. I also find it as a hunter that that's a way to really think about the improvement of forest conditions, that tribal agroforestry lens about the diversity of understory that promotes the well-being of these animals that we hunt and drive food from. And thinking about alley cropping, um, you know, what can this be for tribal agricultural and forestry values? I think this is an emergent area of agroforestry that tribes and other producers can be looking at and working. Um, this is an opportunity for tribes and those producers to consider agriculture, range, and forestry planting configurations that promote commercial, cultural, and other ecologically climate resilient and better adapted crops. Consider water use efficiency, because um, that's one of the factors of drought and, and water scarcity. Thinking about drought tolerant species or varieties, being fire adapted and then thinking about carbon sequestration traits or those other phenotypic varieties or types that help us achieve this. And I think there's a lot of work here that could again expand on alley crops through these uh, kind of more integrated systems. Here's some an example of this from more based on traditional agroforestry practices of shrubs in, in the Pacific West, particularly for California. Um, this is the work of Kat Anderson. If you're not familiar with it, she has a book called Tending the Wild. But, you know, we think about there's some alternatives there about rejuvenating or not these shrub species, looking at the role of fire and then those horticultural practices that promote um, that fully developed shrub that relates to those growth forms that are used for, in this case, basketry um, or nut production. There's a variety and a wealth amongst tribal communities um, about management of shrubs as an understory species that's part of the agroforestry system. I think literally from coast to coast and from north to south, um, a diversity of plant resources that go into tribal basketry um, historically, but also of importance today. And thinking about the technology in, for me, working with basket weavers or as a traditional food cook, there's a gold standard of what the best material is. And when we can learn that from our tribal practitioners, that can help guide us about the management implications or the strategy we have to help produce that material. And so I've really learned that again through traditional foods and through basketry material about back constructing, hey, these are the best shoots. How do we get to that through our agroforestry management practices? This one relates to the California hazel bush or California beaked hazel um, in more open light conditions when it's burned and then grows back a couple years after. Um, the burning reduces the pest, which is the filbert weevil and moth. Same thing affects the acorns. Uh, you can have these long straight shoots. And then after tip pruning that with more light, you can actually produce the nuts. And so in this case here, I show you an example of how you use the size of those shoots to make a basket that actually is the same thing you harvest the hazelnuts in. So that's a hazelnut basket for harvesting hazel shoots. But that's just an example of my front area, front garden area and my daughter's fairy garden where we've transplanted those, tip layered them, transplanted them, and now we produce hazelnuts and basket shoots. Another example here is looking at um, huckleberry. This is uh, Vicinium ovatum. A very common understory plant through um, Northwest California up to British Columbia. We have a variety here in Northern California. So we have two variants. One is light blue or bloom and another dark purple one. But in this work, um, Colleen Rozier, you know, she basically developed a metric based on cultural practitioner of, you know, what is the huckleberry patch quality and what is that in relating to habitat condition for good marginal or poor. And so through a variety of her plots, she was able to look at tree density, canopy cover, patch openings, and thinking about both the burning and the tending regime of those ecosystem services and that nexus between ecosystem and human and social systems 
um, that related to fostering huckleberry production. And so many cases you can have huckleberry bush density, but if you don't have the light and you don't have the right horticultural practices intending to that, then you're not going to have the berries, which aren't going to be there for the poll or the flowers there for the pollinators, which then aren't going to be kissed by the bees and by the by the butterflies and the hummingbirds to create the berries later on. And so we have the potential again, that gold standard. You see my daughter there in the lower picture holding those tips again from the front yard garden next to the, huckleberry, the hazel bushes I had, um, or an example on Colleen's hand over here on the left for that huckleberry patch quality five, we could be many for that abundance. And I, as a practitioner, um, you know, going to the same patches again and again over years and looking at these management, you can really facilitate an abundance of these highly rich, um, productive, tasty, valuable, energetically food resources that many birds and animals uh, rely upon, plus us as, as, as humans. So just a huckleberry is an example there for many vicinniums. Also, just not to go into it here much, but um, also there's, you know, fire increases a lot of berry production. And so when we're thinking about our greenways, the edges of our farms, our ranches, between the alley, uh, alley cropping, these other aspects, there's an abundance of potential opportunity there to increase the abundance of berries, whether it's trailing blackberry, the wild strawberries, and others um, based on whichever region you may have as an edible berry. Windbreaks, this is one I think also is an emergent aspect of um, potential agroforestry systems that maybe more tribes or tribal communities could be looking into. I just add this little thought here that there's opportunities for tribes and other agroforestry producers to consider agriculture range and forestry planting configurations that promote, again, commercial, cultural, and other ecological climate resilient and better adapted crops. <coughs> Excuse me. Consider water use efficiency in this as well as your plantings for drought tolerance, fire adapted, and carbon sequestration tra traits. And, you know, really we're seeing a lot of the fires in the West, unfortunately, are wind driven and are a major contributor to wildfire intensity coupled with the fuel loading. And there may be aspects to think about how to live with wildfire and thinking about windbreaks as part of that buffer between our our farmlands, our ranches, um, and that of our own home communities. Repairing buffers um, is a particularly an important one. Uh, also historically, and in, in, in now where a lot of us live along rivers and creeks and these lower valley areas, um, repairing buffers for many of the tribes out west are the protection of anatomous fisheries such as salmon, lamprey, suckers, and sturgeon, but also for freshwater mussels, invertebrates, reptiles, and other amphibians and birds and animals. Yeah. Can restoration of forests, fire regimes, and cultural practices be a form of climate adaptation? So really, you know, thinking about the primary objectives to restore fire regimes, which will restore the structure, composition, and ecological, culturally valuable, valuable functions of forest, shrub, and grassland habitats. For many tribal communities, and it was mentioned by our prior speakers, teaching traditional ecological knowledge and fire ecology intergenerationally, um, especially for getting the youth. Thinking about the initial fuels reduction or prescribed fire treatments located near communities, in critical road re, uh, road systems, key habitats, at least out west, have been those meadows, pine, oak dominated forests, mixed conifer hardwood, which I've shown, and these grassland environments where fires long been absent, but were very, um, very much some of the more formally tribally burned areas across the landscape. And again, restoring components of that, um, thinking about climate adaptation. And that's a lot of the work that many tribes are bringing forward with their cultural burning efforts. These look at the wildland urban interface. You can have the protection of property and resources from undesired wildfires. Think about the social, cultural well-being and local economies as far as forms of security. Many tribes with their academic partners and other entities are looking at food security and food sovereignty. Um, and that food is good medicine, an important part of that. But having access or the foraging or gathering and harvesting efficiency for those crops. Thinking about the quantity and quality of the habitat and those resources there. What are the culturally important metrics to help guide that? And then thinking about a variety of, of treatments that can take place, um, whether it's the manual understory chainsaw thinning or, or mastication or the me mechanical thinning of tree removal, whole tree removal. Thinking about patch, uh, pile and broadcast burning, managing wildfires for resource benefit. So we see many wildfires affecting um, our wildland urban interfaces and our, our ranches and our homes and our communities, our farms. Um, so thinking about even wildfire management and the hardening or resistance that you can increase through your agroforestry strategies. And then, you know, things like where that helps aid fire suppression or some cases, maybe not managing with fire so frequently as having fire free or protected areas. I wanted to share this little component here, 
um, about thinking about legacy vegetation. You know, I know, realize this might not be um, as available in other places, um, but for us out here in the West, I have this picture here of this wide full crown live oak. Um, this grew basically at an important nexus of soil types and geology area, but this is a full crown open, huge live oak. That first branch in the uh, kind of middle right part of the picture, I can climb up and get it there to where I'm standing with my hand on the tree. Um, this grew in a very open area, very low fuel type, was culturally burned, or else that tree wouldn't have had that growth characteristic. An example in the middle here is these double stem big tan oak. This is at a known food acorn gathering area, a legacy orchard. Um, it used to have lower branches. Those are the nubs where the moss is at that have been shaded off because of fire exclusion and suppression and removal of that indigenous tending but those are legacy and the structure that guide us to how fire was being used there. Or the example on the lower left, um, looking at an old gnarled manzanita, which is an understory shrub. I was on a more open ridge system that was formerly used for its berries, um, for food and for sugar, its wood for heating and for ceremonial purposes and other medicinal aspects of that. Plus the manzanita uh, flowers right now are an important one for our early pollinators. Um, and we've lost that because of fire exclusion and suppression and the removal of indigenous fire stewardship. But these are all agroforestry legacies that are tied to that fire regime that otherwise have been assumed to be natural um, by most of the Western academic training. So it's also rethinking about how we look at nature and learn and have nature as our teacher for the next generation of living with fire. So in, in approaching this and thinking about scaling up, you know, really can go from sites to landscape resilience for working with tribal and community agroforestry landscapes. It's the recovery of tribal stewardship practices with diverse partners that benefit tribes, landowners, and the public or society at large. It's considerations for achieving shared resources and uh, through those management values, the development of commercial, non-commercial goods and related products. Um, there's emergent aspects of the bioeconomy, looking at sustainability and climate adaptation. And it's having the alignment of those local projects and regional programs with national policies and authorities, as well as that funding support. And so I think there's a lot coming out with the infrastructure bill. I think there's going to be a lot of work out in the Western states of looking at how to do fuels reduction or pile civil culture or to learn to live with wildfire. And there's a, a ripe opportunity for agroforestry to be integrated into that. And then the last part is for many tribes and those that I'm working with, particularly with the Karuk and the Yurok and other tribes out West, is the climate adaptation practices that really range from the coastal to the interior along those rivers and valleys over mountains that increase the heterogeneity um, and that resilience of those human and natural systems as we move forward. Reference uh, some of the work here with the Karuk tribes climate adaptation plan. I had a hand in that. <laughs> See my hand holding acorns and huckleberries there as they're burning. Um, and really, you know, there's different aspects here. If you're looking at climate adaptation, I would reference you to some of the work by the Southwest and the Northwest Climate Adaptation Science Center, uh, the various tribes that are having their own climate vulnerability and adaptation planning efforts and thinking about well, there's opportunities to do that through agroforestry partnerships. And then this last part, um, again, I blew through this presentation a little bit faster than I thought. But um, I wanted just to draw your attention to some of these last resources here of thinking about um, indigenous stewardship methods through NRCS. Um, also myself at home, I've been doing this with my EQIP uh, environmental quality incentive program for, for my home work there, looking at the forest thinning and learning and agroforestry approaches. There's some agroforestry notes there that Colleen Rozier and I developed. There's this additional work with, uh, with work with the National Agroforestry Center folks like Kate McFarland, and then also my work there more on the Forest Service side, my colleague Jonathan Long and others um, looking at bringing those tribal ecocultural resources and engagement as part of that forest landscape restoration strategy, and particularly with the PNW Tribal Agroforestry Working Group, um, getting more into that effort for tribes through Washington and California. Um, and I will make this presentation. I sent a copy to Hannah, so you'll be able to have uh, Hannah to be able to have this later on for reference. And I just really wanted to say, you know, this last ending part is this work has really been just some of my thoughts and my creativity, but it's really my colleagues that bring um, the richness of their knowledge and experience, particularly through agroforestry, 
um, to me to be able to relate this to you. And so I really feel like I've been the beneficiary of a lot of knowledge and, and partners and colleagues and friends in this effort. Um, and that work has really been supportive of me being able to share these ideas today. So thank you. I'm wrapping it up there. Thank you so much, Frank. Thank this has been so incredible. Um, I went ahead and muted you so we don't have the feedback. I don't know if others are hearing that too. But um, we do have some questions that have been coming in through the Q&A that I would love to share and that are in line with some of the things I've been wondering about too. So this, this first one that had been um, shared uh, from an anonymous attendee, can you share your thoughts on invasive species? <clears throat> I see so many well-intentioned people, yeah, like so many herbicides and, um, and you know, in thinking about um, invasive species and, and some of the other changes also to the landscape through colonization and, you know, just ongoing um, globalization, it's, uh, it's a lot to wrap our minds around in thinking about integrating tribal knowledges and practices. So I'm curious if you have thoughts on, on those sort of big, bigger que picture question and then that specific question um, from the yeah, so um, I need to share a statement skill because I threw this quarter and I anticipated it, so I thought we might have to have a go back. So I'll just leave my presentation there, or do you want me to um, stop sharing? Um, you know, either way is fine. I think it's helpful to keep this up, um, unless if you want to share your video um, and stop sharing. No, I, I don't have the band at home. Okay. It's breaking up. That's so fine. That's I, fine. I'll jump into the, so. You know, it's funny because I, I a lot of this work comes out of tribal perspectives and values. And so in working with the tribes, you know, we talk about um, invasive. Well, there's also a native invasive species that, like in our case, would be Douglas fir taken over places because of fire exclusion. But when we think about um, exotic uh, we, weeds or other plants that have really changed the, the soil configuration, the soil chemistry, or out competing other things. I think many tribes have kind of this assessment that I've seen is you know, what's the function or what's the whole serving? And is it taking over uh, too much of those other valued aspects or what is the role in the service that's providing? And so I think a lot of tribes as practitioner level will evaluate that. You, you can see examples in tribal ethnobotany where a lot of the European or Asian species were adopted, still um, were incorporated into that tribal plant use um, as part of the, more of a, a cultural adaptation. Uh, but also I think an important one is many of the federal and state uh, entities, agencies have an aspect of like, oh, we want to do invasive species removal. And they'll go in there and say, take out all this one kind of thistle. But again, from a teaching of a tribal elder, Ron Good at the North Fork Mono in the Central Sierra Nevadas in California, was, you know, we have a, they have a tribal philosophy where you, you, you're supposed to serve your relations and feed them. And if you're thinking about your pollinators, why would you eradicate an invasive species, all of it, until you've adequately provided the reestablishment of the native thistle or the native surrogate that was there? And so think about that. You know, not, not all invasive species necessarily, um, they have duality in their functions and their service. And I think many of the tribal people I've worked with evaluate that and say, yeah, well, maybe we can remove, you know, like in our case out, many of the fire things like scotch broom or um, French broom are horrible for coming back after fire areas and affecting it. And you really got to work at it, particularly if you're not using herbicides, but they're important pollinators to a certain degree, but that one, you know, you want to remove it and get more of the native plants underneath there in the understory. So there's really a mixed bag as far as uh, tribal beliefs or philosophies and values for invasives. Um, but I, most of my experience in tribes that they're against herbicide use and that they would look at more manual or other treatments that would uh, uh, avoid that. And, and that can be very labor intensive and also um, really challenging, especially for like us out here in the West with Himalayan blackberry. I mean, you open an area up and then it gets established in there and you gotta be on it. And something short of a DR mower or, you know, tractor, uh, you gotta look at different ways that you can affect the, the loading of those invasives and then be able to help restore components of the native plants you want to re, re, reset, reestablish there. Thank you for that. And did you have any other thoughts you wanted to share about this sort of bigger picture? Um, you know, how uh, tribal communities are facing 
all of the changes or evolving with, you know, changing and growing along with all of the changes that have come from colonization onward. You know, my, one of my things is, you know, we, I think for Western academically trained folks, we have to look at, you know, part of decolonizing our, our, our thoughts and our that lead our strategies and working with indigenous communities is to have that reconciliation process to learn about what's changed, you know, and some of my writings with John Parada and Christian Gardenia and others, uh, we have this chapter on forest landscape restoration and it's, you know, what does degradation mean when you're looking at forest landscape restoration or restoration? Well, degradation is a different perspective if you're an indigenous person and have had one factor multiple factors of the colonial settler legacy impacted you it's another one if you're looking at as a restoration or another entity an NGO to say no well this is how we define degradation and it might not be really representing those colonial factors that have led to the removal of indigenous people that then led to the ecological degradation and so we have to think about that broader aspects. And so for me, it's kind of the, the reconciliation, the recognizing that it's the repatriation, returning of indigenous knowledge and cultural practices as part of that, that facilitates restoration that then leads to help supporting that indigenous knowledge and practice revitalization. So well said, thank you. Um, I'm gonna move on to another question. Um, I don't imagine we'll have time for all of them today, but feel free to continue posting those in the Q&A. Um, and for those we don't have time to address, um, we'll add them to the discussion board on the community forum for the symposium. So the next one I'm seeing here is um, from uh, someone from Dartmouth College on unceded Abenaki land saying, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. Two questions. What are the major differences in tribal agroforestry practices between the Northwest and the Northeast of the US? So that's question one. And then the second question was, um, they're saying they're an environmental humanist and working on a more than human digital, uh, digital ethnography of a forest in Enfield, New Hampshire, in collaboration with tribal leaders of uh, the Kowasak band of the Abenaki Penacook people. Do you have suggestions on tribal agroforestry scholars who work on northeastern forests um, that they could contact? So that first question again, major differences in tribal agroforestry practices between the, the northeast and northwest. Yeah, so uh, full transparency, I'm not as familiar with the northeast. Uh, I have mostly again studied tribal fire and uses, and I am aware of through needing to feature some of these. Um, across Maine, other parts of the Northeast tribes, you know, working at reinstating burning for say the, the, the huckleberry or the blueberries and, and I think the cottontail rabbits, one of those back there. There's also more of looking at the hardwood management. Um, so really for me, it's, it's, it would be going back to and saying, you know, what are those tribal interests and in restoration and what species are they focusing on? Is it ash for basketry? Is it something else? Is it maybe, um, the blueberries, you know, is it maybe another critical plant? And, and have we maybe, again, assumed that would to be more of a natural, but really it was a more embedded agroforestry system, an indigenous agroforestry system that we need to kind of deconstruct our way of thinking about and looking at as an opportunity. So when, I, again, I don't know much about the Northeast. Um, and then the second part, uh, forgot that part. So was the second part of that question? The second part was, um, that uh, they're working on a more than human digital ethnography um, of a forest in Enfield, New Hampshire, which sounds fascinating to me. <laughs> yeah. And collaboration so, with tribal leaders, yeah. Yeah, so is that kind of like a visual, visualization tool? You know, most of the work, and it's been done with one of our University of Oregon graduate students, Kirsten Vignetta, who's done the, the figures and the drawings and the crew climate plan and others I've been using to kind of depict what that desired condition would be because we haven't been able to restore to it yet and physically have kind of a, a surrogate to be able to say, hey, this is what we're managing towards. Those are becoming a little bit more, but um, I think some of those aspects, again, I'd write, relate back to those metrics or variables of importance to that cultural community or that tribe. Um, what is the gold standard? You know, for, for me and going both as a scientist and more as a practitioner, going into a forested area or area, and I can tell by the pruning, I can tell by the tree spacing, the, the crown structure, that that was a more intensively managed area. Um, and so it's part of that 
gradient of like, oh, this is horticulture or permaculture. This is, you know, you can see the pruning, you can see the fostering of this tree spacing. Um, it's going to be more of a, a less of that kind of the row and spacing that we find in more of a Western approach. But within that, you're going to be visualizing things that are more, I say, bioclimatically suitable or adapted. And we have to think as we come together as partners, what does that look like on that, on that gradient across that valley or from, you know, the estuary up into the, up that river, river system and across the mountain range? How does that vary across um, the potential logic and vegetation types there? And, and, and where and how would you foster that resistance or resilience? Think about the climate suitability, because there's been a lot of projections there for some of the work done um, about plant community dynamics, and then which of those uh, would you be able to foster? And so I think, again, that, that that cultural teaching of what kind of the desired condition is, is also going to be looking at the functionality and the services that that particular plant or that system can offer. Thank you for that. Um, there are have been a couple other questions related to other regions, so I don't want to belabor that since, you know, you clearly have a tremendous expertise in the, the Pacific Northwest and Southwest. So, you know, related to that, um, I have noticed that um, it seems like there's a really strong cultural network for um, the, the, this cultural burning, um, these practices in that part of this continent. And I'm curious if, um, if you see that there's a reason for that or, or, if, or if I'm maybe just missing um, some of the other networks and organizations and coalitions that have maybe come together in other other areas for these practices. Well, you know, my my whole part, I let me see, go all the way back in my presentation, but you know, way back when I talk about uh, at the beginning about you know forming fire dependent cultures, in that aspect, um, nearly all the tribes across Western North America from Mexico and Canada, um, from, you know, Ontario over to BC and across were fire dependent cultures. Um, and, and I'm thinking about the work from a forest service scientist day DEY, who's looked at the hardwoods and forests of the East coast. Um, there's also work that's being done, uh, in the Southwest. So when we think about like the inhabitants film and it shows the Hopi farmer there, um, there's other tribes like the Apache that are looking at Emory Oak restoration. And part of that Emory Oak was an important acorn that was used that also related to how mesquite was managed nearby it, even down to say let's exiguate or sandbar coyote willow on the river bars. I mean, all, all these things really uh, touch base. If you look at each area, so much of the indigenous agroforestry or land adaptation and living with living in place was part of that intentional modification of the fire regime that was the blend of their use of that environment. And so as we look at strategies to live with wildfire, um, we're seeing it really pronounced in the West, but it's just a matter of time on the East Coast before you start having persistent drought or extreme weather events, and you're going to have a fire problem there too. It's on its way. Um, and so I think many aspects, as I try to find here in my slide, but I think many aspects of that is to be thinking about, well, how the tribes use fire energetically? How can we use that in a contemporary um, setting to alleviate the threats and the, fact, uh, and the negative effects of wildfire? And then how do we begin to use fire more on our terms proactively? Um, and it really from a colonial government perspective that suppressed it and demonized it and had fire excluded out, out of many areas. Um, it's coming back to, to humbly affect us about, hey, you got to come to terms with fire, you got to come to terms with climate change, and the solutions are going to be hard won to be able to come to that point of, of doing that. And again, I, I just put this, you know, agroforestry framework out there because it really ties back and anchors into um, these ancestral systems of this landscape that in many cases we're trying to restore or we see assemblages or components of it in the past that we want and so we want to be able to you know think about well without co-opting or taking over that indigenous knowledge and practice how do we work with those tribal entities to to come to a place in our broader society and i think agroforestry is a good way of doing that anyways yeah that is all really um really important um and and thank you so much i think <clears throat> i think that is a really nice way of 
bringing everything together so so neatly with the theme for this year's symposium um, and considering how indigenous knowledges and science uh, is so important for contributing to agroforestry practices. Um, so thank you once again. If anyone has a burning question, no pun intended, um, that you didn't have a chance to ask, um, this is your time to use that raise hand button and I can unmute you. Otherwise, please everyone be sure to check out the, um, the film screening that's available through the Agroforestry Symposium. The film is called Inhabitants and Frank Lake um, plays an important role in that film. Um, and you can see more about the work that, that he and others have been doing um, on the West Coast in that. And I do see one hand raised here. So I am going to allow you to talk. You should be able to unmute yourself now. Hi, hi Frank. Hello. Um, I've been working, uh, thanks for the presentation, really a lot of information. Wonderful, um, awesome. Uh, I've been working to find land near other organic farmers for, or land stewards or indigenous, uh, indigenous nations. And the purpose of that is to form areas of exclusion in the form of land grants, for exclusion of pesticides, GMOs, fossil fuels, plastics, and synthetic chemicals. Is this something that uh, you or your associations, your relatives could be interested in to pursue? Um, I, Go ahead. Yeah, I guess for me as a federal scientist, I just, yeah, as a force service scientist, I'm just working on the various networks to think about, again, more on the research. How do we conduct the research to um, inform management? The more of that permaculture side and that farm side are land easements and conservancies. Melissa, Dr. Melissa Nelson, she's um, Anishinaabe, I believe. She's with the Cultural Conservancy, so they've been looking at some of that. I know um, like Teresa Romero with the Chumash and, and looking at in Southern California is looking at land conservancy opportunities to reinstate cultural burning. Um, I was also going to say more broadly, um, you know, tribes are looking at the effort, but that's really each of them. Each tribe as a federal government, as a government entity, usually have a uh, TIPA, Tribal Environmental Protection Act funded aspect that looks at toxins and, and aspects of water quality and pollutants. So, you know, maybe tribes... Uh, as they reacquire lands, are, are looking at some of those alternatives. Um, just my general familiarity on that. Thank you. There is one other question that was added in the chat too, um, asking you to share about the wording and inclusivity of cultural fire in current climate plans and approach to relations and responsibilities, um, an important model of an in indigenous led climate adaptability. Yeah, so if I'm understanding it correctly, so, you know, part of for tribes are asserting this more is their pre, pre prior and informed consent for the way that their knowledge and cultural practices are being represented. And I think sometimes even in our best intents as Western academic trained writers, we have a certain bias that we're not aware of. And so by tribes writing their own climate plans, doing their own vulnerability assessments, they get to the point where they're not being ascribed that vulnerability but they're really detailing their own impacts of colonization of climate on them and kind of having that sovereign representation of their own, of their own ways they're being affected. Um, so I'd say, you know, look, look to that as being a different way. I think also some of the things that have been proposed for like assisted migration and other aspects, um, different tribes have different values on that. Um, and, and some of the things that are being proposed by more of a Western academic approach to climate mitigation in that regard. So just, you know, just to be aware of some of those and learn of them um, and, and when you're working with an indigenous community or a tribe uh, in your area. And then the last thing I wanted to go back was on cultural burning. You know, there's a lot of work through the Indigenous Peoples Burning Network. Um, there's a healthy country plan that we've developed and I've been a part of for the Yurokup on Karuk. We're also working with Giftlick, the Great Lakes uh, Indian Fish Get Commission back there. There's efforts in the Southwest with tribes, um, up in Washington and Oregon, definitely. Uh, Amy, Dr. Amy Christensen, who's Matisse, First Nations woman uh, up in uh, Alberta area is working also with First Nations groups uh, in, in British Columbia. So there's a you know growing, uh, I can think of um, the, Eastern Band Cherokee, I can think of others in the Southeast, the Seminole, um, 
the porch band of the of the porch creek um are also doing stuff in the southeast so there's a, an emergent aspect of cultural burning and again a lot of it goes back to restoring forest kind of more this broader approach of agroforestry although it's not been related as such but they're doing it you know they're looking at basketry and food and and um wildlife and ungulate part to be able to do that so i i would again you know look at what tribes are doing look at their web pages look at their newsletters um the osage speaker this morning really hit it um i forget her name off the top of my head but you know that was a good example of you know their food sovereignty approaches um those are happening in lots of other places too yeah yeah that was jan hayman j-a-n-n -N hayman from osage nation dnr um Okay, with that, we are actually at the end of the hour. Thank you again so much, Frank Lake, um, for being part of this event. And we look forward to staying connected in the future. Yeah, and, and look to the National Agroforestry Center um, through USDA. Again, you know, we have a lot of partnerships like with Oregon State University and EcoTrust um, on the PNW Working Group, but it's only going to expand. And so, you know, I early my hat off to them and for helping us at, in that effort. Wonderful, thank you. Just want to share much gratitude to everyone who has been part of this today, participants and presenters alike. Yep, thank you again. And for the person asking Chaparral, Ron, look to the work by Keeley and Anderson on Native California Native Management of Chaparral. You'll be surprised.